now, there still seems to be a big misconception about the American Revolution in that oftentimes we say, people will say that the Americans and the British fought dramatically different from one another. Uh, the general idea is that the British were always regimented and always fought in tight, strict line, whereas the Americans were guerrilla fighters who knew how to hide behind rocks and trees. That's not really true. Um, both sides used essentially the same tactics. Both sides used the same equipment and the same weapons. Uh, if they were fighting in rough terrain with small numbers of men, both British and Amer Patriot forces would fight skirmish style in open lines using cover. If either side had large numbers of men in open terrain, they would fight in strict regimented tight lines. It depended upon the situation, but both sides were essentially learning from the same tactical books. Uh, both sides has had essentially the same weapon. This musket that I'm carrying right now is an example of a French style musket that was common among American troops. They also would use British and sometimes even German model muskets, but the make and manufacture didn't matter all that much to its basic use. This was a flintlock smooth bore muzzle loading weapon. The flintlock basically meant where I today for safety have a piece of wood, there would be a piece of stone or flint in this cock or hammer mechanism. When I pull this trigger, this flint would fly forward and strike against the steel plate, creating sparks, setting off powder that I would place in this pan. Some of the flame that would shoot up from that powder would go through a tiny touch hole into the breech, setting off the main charge. The entire process took about, in training at least, took about 15 seconds. So a well-trained soldier was supposed to be able to load and fire this gun about three or four times a minute. They often would actually shoot a lot slower in combat in order to conserve their ammunition because the battles would often rage for long periods of time. In between firing those guns, they also depended a lot on the use of the bayonet. And in some cases, both American and British troops would launch attacks and ambushes with unloaded weapons, attacking with the bayonet only. Not too far away, over in Paoli, British troops attacked and ambushed an American force at night with bayonet only and won a decisive battle. It was so one-sided, Americans often called it the, pa the Paoli Massacre. Knowing how to fight with the bayonet, knowing how to fight in both open order and in closed ranks was vital to both sides. And the training that was necessary to do that, the discipline that was necessary to be able to do that, to load and fire this weapon efficiently while under fire, while experiencing the the roar and chaos and violence of battle was absolutely vital for a soldier, and it was not something that could be learned quickly. Even the British felt that it took at least a full year of that to make a soldier a good soldier. It is December 19th, 1777. Now that means that the American Revolution has already been waging for over two and a half years. It's been a year and a half since the Americans in Philadelphia had de officially declared independence from the British at the Pennsylvania State House, which is Independence Hall today. Since then, things have not been going well for General Washington's army here in Pennsylvania. The British up in New York City send an invasion fleet down into the Chesapeake. They land an army in Maryland. That army marches up into Pennsylvania. Its goal is to capture Philadelphia, the biggest city in America in those days, which was a sprawling metropolis of barely 30,000 people. Uh, the British succeed. They defeat Washington at the Battle of Brandywine one of the biggest battles of the war. They defeat a portion of his army at the Battle of Paoli. They capture two American forts, Fort Mifflin and Fort Mercer along the Delaware, uh, and they're able to occupy Philadelphia. 
Congress has fled. They're in exile over in Yorktown. Today we call it York, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania's executive council, their rebel government, the state government, has fled as well. They're over in Reading right now. Thousands of other Philadelphia residents are now refugees out in the countryside. Washington tries one last time to force the British out of Philadelphia before they're able to dig in by launching a surprise attack at Germantown and fails and is forced to retreat. The British are dug in, winter is setting in, the weather is getting worse, and Washington's army is exhausted. The men are tired, the equipment is worn out. Washington needs to find a place to regroup, refit, and plan his next move. And he chooses Valley Forge. This location of farm, this farming community out here, uh, named after an iron forge that was located in a nearby valley, was only about 20 miles outside of the city of Philadelphia, close enough to the British to contain them and bottle them up in the city and protect the countryside and its resources, but also just far away enough so if the British attacked, they could see it coming, and on high ground that could provide a good defensive position. And while this army is here, they have to struggle through difficult months of regrowth and rebuilding. Uh, their supply system collapses. Supply shortages, food, clothing, blankets uh, become ever-present. Uh, and disease runs rampant. This is one of the deadliest encampments of the war. More soldiers end up dying at Valley Forge than in any single battle during the Revolution. And yet, this was also a much needed opportunity for Washington to reorganize the army and train and reform it uh, using the assistance of other officers like General Knox, General Green, uh, General von Steuben. They proceed to do a top-down restructuring of this army. So by the time the army leaves Valley Forge, months later, in, on June 19th, 1778, in spite of all the hardship, in spite of all the death that they encountered here, they're actually stronger, better trained, and better organized than they've ever been. After they leave here, they chase the British through New Jersey and engage the British at the Battle of Monmouth. That is not the end of the war, though. This war is going to wage for another five years. But a lot of the organizing and restructuring and reforms that they do here are going to allow this army to survive and continue for those next five years. I really think Washington's greatest victory of this war was not the surrender of Cornwallis at Yorktown. It's the fact that he was able to keep this army alive and functioning for eight years. That is the battle that he fought at Valley Forge, and it is why places like this are so important in that conflict story. Most Americans today have an image of Washington's crossing the Delaware during the Revolutionary War. He's at the bow of a boat, his knee up, looking stoically forward as his men push through an ice floe to get him across a very vast river, much wider than the Delaware that I have behind me today. That is the myth of Washington's crossing. The reality is much more compelling than that. George Washington's army had been forced out of New York. Defeat after defeat during the New York campaign forced him to go into New Jersey, fall back into Pennsylvania. By the time he arrived in Pennsylvania, it's mid-December, and the British had been hot on his heels. But they decide not to cross the Delaware River. They know that winter is coming, and most European armies do not campaign during winter season. They decide to stay on the New Jersey side of the river and go into winter quarters. Their field commander, Lord Charles Cornwallis, even goes a step farther and decides he's going to go back to London and not even stay on the continent for the winter. The British Army is so certain that the Continental Army will not survive this winter that they are not going to keep actively campaigning. Washington's army had lost almost 90% of its strength since it engaged in the campaigns around New York. Enlistments are about to run out at the end of 1776 for Washington. His army is disintegrating around him. It is up to Washington to keep his army together and keep the colonial movement towards revolution and towards independence going forward. To do so, he is going to cross the Delaware and embark on a winter campaign. He has 5,000 or so men that he could cross the Delaware River with. 
He brings together a council of war. He talks to his generals and they decide to cross the river at McConkie's Ferry and a number of other sites. He'll utilize John Glover and his Marble Headers, who are essentially their amphibious wing of the Continental Army, men who had helped extract the army from New York by crossing the river. These hardy sailors are going to go down to boats along the Delaware River, pile men into them, and cross the river. A river crossing is not something to be taken lightly for an army. Men, materiel, horses, and artillery have to be ferried across. So specific boats like Durham boats, heavy duty boats have to be used to ferry men across the river. And let's keep in mind something. It's winter. There's ice flows on the river. So when George Washington decides to cross here on Christmas night of December 25th, 1776, when he jumps into his boat, he is not like that Lutz painting. He is not standing at the bow of his ship. He is probably sitting down, trying to keep warm. It's below freezing out here. A snow and rainstorm will come across these men as they push on towards Trenton. Not to mention, if his boat hits an ice flow out in the middle of the Delaware and he topples over as he stands there stoically and majestically at the bow of a ship, the Continental Army may lose its commander. Hypothermia might set in, or his men may never find him in the dark. This is a dangerous crossing. It's fighting the elements. It's fighting time. Because as Washington's going across the Delaware River here, he is trying to get to Trenton, New Jersey as quickly as possible. He's trying to destroy a garrison of Hessian soldiers, 1,500 or so men, who hopefully have been celebrating so much Christmas that they will not expect a Continental Army attack. And that's exactly what happens. Washington crosses the river here. He converges on Trenton. And the crossing here is going to bring victory because it was done so quickly. It was done in secret that he is able to strike Trenton, surround most of the German garrison, and land a blow against the British officers. Charles Cornwallis is forced to cancel his trip to London and come back and start to deal with the fox that he calls George Washington. December 1776. Spirits are low in the Continental Army, but on Christmas night, George Washington famously crosses the Delaware River and falls upon a Hessian garrison at Trenton and wins the first battle of Trenton. He recrosses back into Pennsylvania at that point, and American independence is achieved, right? Not remotely. Washington will, in fact, soon after recross the Delaware back into New Jersey and take position at Trenton along Assen Pink Creek. He's going to have his men begin to construct earthworks there to confront the British. But the enlistments of many of Washington's men are about to expire, and Washington will make an appeal to his men. If you will stay one month longer, you will render that service to your country that might not be possible under any other circumstance. And soon after, one man steps forward to answer the call, and then another and another, till basically all of Washington's men are staying with him, getting ready to fight. And the result of that will be the Second Battle of Trenton, fought along Assen Pink Creek. Now facing the Americans will be Lord Charles Cornwallis, who has 8,000 men in Princeton, New Jersey. He's going to detach 5,500 of those soldiers and march them south toward Trenton to confront George Washington. Washington, of course, has expected this. He's going to send a contingent out under Colonel Edward Hand, and Hand's men take position between the two forces at a place called Five Mile Creek. The British have to deploy to deal with Hand's men, and Hand and his soldiers fall back from Five Mile Creek, but behind every rock, behind every tree, they are peppering the British, slowing the British advance by hours before they can even approach the town of Trenton. As Han's men begin to fall back, Washington sends more troops out, Rhode Islanders. They joined Han's men in the streets, and it further slows the British at that point. And there's only about an hour of daylight left by the time the British finally confront the American position along Aston Pink Creek. And when Han's men and the Rhode Islanders fell back across the creek, there they see an inspiring sight. George Washington astride his horse, inspiring his men. And the men gather around him. They are strong when the British the strongest military power on the face of the earth, attack the American line. And the Americans hold through a bloody exchange of, of small arms, of artillery fire, the Americans hold. The British fall back, they attack again, the same thing happens. But the Americans are starting to suffer some losses at this point. George Washington will order up his reserve. 1,800 militiamen under the command of John Cadwallader. Cadwallader brings his men forward, the British attack again. And this third attack is particularly bloody. The Americans repulse the British just like they had before and the bridge is red with blood at that point. 
Cornwallis is disappointed he has not won, but is confident he will win in the morning. In a daylight, he will attack and has no doubt the Americans will be there. But George Washington has other plans. After the fighting ended, he takes a look and sees the Sawmill Road, a road that will allow him to fall upon the other British garrison at Princeton, New Jersey. So when Cornwallis arrays for battle the next morning, he goes and sees Americans over there, but it's just an artillery screen. The artillery opens up, but George Washington is long gone. He takes the Sawmill Road, he marches to Princeton, New Jersey, where he will win his first great victory over British regular soldiers in the field. And these soldiers, these citizen soldiers who had already left their farms and families, who had stayed beyond their terms of enlistment, decided to fight. They fought for what they believed in, and they fought for the hope that maybe by fighting at places like Second Trenton, American independence could take root. The smoothbore musket was the standard weapon for both armies or both sides during this war, whether it was Patriot and Loyalist militia, Continental soldiers, British regular troops, or German Hessian troops. The basic use, style, and technique for fighting was exactly the same, whether you are holding a gun that was made in the United States, or in Germany, or in England. Uh, or from France. Even before the French had officially allied with the United States, they were already smuggling thousands of weapons and supplies to the United States uh, to help us fight the British. So here in Valley Forge, uh, the early British guns that the Americans were using were slowly being replaced with these French model muskets. So. Viva la France. Unlike the militia soldiers or hunters that would use powder horns and pour and measure out the powder, everything would be preloaded in wrapped paper cartridges with the ammunition on the top and a fixed load of powder at the bottom. You would take, hold those cartridges in cartridge boxes like this, which would have various openings and holes that would secure each one. And then you would keep it wrapped up and covered in a nice, hopefully waterproof container like this cartridge box. You would reach in, take out one of those paper cartridges, and tear them open. You would then proceed to pour some of the black powder into this one pan. Close the pan so that the powder wouldn't fall out. Take the rest of the powder and the paper wadding and the rest of the ammunition, which not only include a ball, but often a couple bits of 22 caliber buckshot in an American combat load. Fill it into the, the muzzle of the gun, making sure that it seats all the way down to the breech. You would take out the ramrod and ram it down. Return the rammer back to its position so that you don't lose or damage it. That's vital. And now the gun was ready to fire. To fire the gun, you pull the hammer back to full cock, level the gun, and when you pulled the trigger, the flint that would be in place of the wood that we have here for safety would scrape against the steel plate, send sparks down into the powder that you had poured into the pan, setting it alight. Some of the flame from that, from that powder would go through a tiny touch hole in the breech of the gun and set off the main charge. That's one shot. You want to shoot it again, you have to start all over. Being able to do this routinely and quickly was one of the primary issues of training for the American and British and German armies. It takes discipline, it takes constant, constant drill to do this properly so that when you are in the chaos and noise of battle, you can still do this efficiently. There were rifles used on both sides, the American long rifle probably being the most famous, but most guns were smoothbore, so think of them as combat shotguns. Their accuracy beyond 50 yards was relatively limited, but they tended to use, as machine gunners in the Army would say today, accuracy by volume. You get enough people shooting quickly in the same general direction, somebody on the other side is going to get hit.
John Adams believed that the American Revolution was in the minds and the hearts of the American people. It was in their attitudes, it was in their sentiments, and that the war for independence was part of that, but it was not solely the American Revolution. By 1815, the United States defeated England twice, once to secure independence, the second time to defend its honor. The two great superpowers of the world, England and France, went to war in 1754. It was the first global conflict. In world history, we call this war the Seven Years' War. In North America, we know it as the French and Indian War. England won the war in 1763, but at tremendous financial and human cost. In an effort to replenish its depleted treasury, Great Britain decided to impose a series of taxes on the colonists to help pay for their own defense. In the English eyes, that seemed fair. But to the American colonists, it was new, and it was outrageous. Public protests began mounting shortly after the taxes were imposed, and by 1775, a full-blown war erupted between England and her North American colonies. A year later, in 1776, the colonies declared their independence from Great Britain, and for the next eight years, George Washington, as Commander-in-Chief of the American Continental Army, would lead his army in battle. He would lose more than he would win but his ability to keep the army together against insurmountable odds made the difference. In 1781, George Washington led a combined American and French army with support of the French Navy against the British at Yorktown, Virginia, and won. The Treaty of Peace was signed with Great Britain in 1783, in which England relinquished her 13 American colonies. But the question was, were the colonies 13 independent nations or were they one United States? That was the key issue at the time. States were taxing each other, there were land disputes over contested territory west of the Appalachian Mountains, Congress was ineffective, there was no strong executive or leadership. In essence, it was a mess. In 1787, it was agreed that delegates from the 13 states would meet in Philadelphia to try to figure out how to fix the Articles of Confederation, the loose framework of government that had guided the United States since 1777. Rather than revise the Articles of Confederation, the members of the Constitutional Convention scrapped them completely and established a new framework of government, the U.S. Constitution, which starts with the stirring preamble, we the people. Between 1783 and 1787, one could argue that the new United States was a failing state. It was beset by all kinds of problems. The Constitution solved the domestic issues, but the international situation was much more complicated. The United States was caught between England and France, who were constantly going to war with each other. Manufacturing was really important, as was trade with Great Britain and France. But Great Britain, particularly Great Britain, began to stop American merchant vessels on the high seas, seize American sailors from those vessels, and press them into service. By June 1812, American honor was at stake. Something had to be done. Even though the United States was new, it needed to find its place in the world. For the next two years, the United States and Great Britain engaged in a war, what we call the War of 1812. There was an attempt on several occasions to move into Canada and bring Canada into the American fold, but they were turned back. But on high seas, it was much better for the Americans, as the American Navy scored numerous victories over British men of war. The largest battle of the war took place in January 1815. Andrew Jackson scored a massive victory against a really well-trained British Army. It was stunning, and it helped the United States find its self-esteem. The War of 1812 is sometimes called the Second War for Independence. And why not? We had defended our honor. The first war was to break away from England. The second war was to prove ourselves. And that's exactly what we did. And Andrew Jackson, the USS Constitution, Francis Scott Key, the Star Spangled Banner are all part of that story. Benedict Arnold is the American version of Judas Iscariot. But to be fair, we have to understand why Arnold betrayed the cause which he ardently supported during the first several years of the American Revolution. 
George Washington often found himself at odds with the Continental Congress over the system of promotions of his fellow officers. He was hamstrung by Congress because Congress controlled not only the purse strings of the war effort, but also controlled who would be promoted and who would not be promoted. And one of the reasons Benedict Arnold betrayed the country for which he fought so strongly for in the first several years of the war was because of the fact that he was not promoted to a position that he believed he deserved. Without a doubt, Benedict Arnold was George Washington's best, bravest, and most ablest battlefield commander. Arnold was the American hero of the American victory at Saratoga. Arnold, who at that time had been dismissed from command by the commanding officer of the Northern Department of the Continental Army, Horatio Gates, was sulking in his tent when at the most crucial moment of the battle, he heard gunfire erupt in the British redoubt held by Hessians. Arnold leads his men into the rear of the Hessian redoubt, and as he charges through the portal, a bullet smashes into his left leg, shattering his femur. After Arnold sustains his wound at Saratoga, and after he is no longer capable of having a battlefield command, Washington appoints Arnold military governor of Philadelphia. Now, Arnold always, always, always wanted to live in the lap of luxury. And as military governor of Philadelphia after the British occupation, Arnold fell in love with a 18 year old flirtatious, beautiful woman, Peggy Shippen. She was the daughter of a Philadelphia loyalist. And Arnold began colluding with the British in 1779, letting the British know through all kinds of ciphering codes about the dispositions and the strategic implications of the Continental Army. And he was being stoked at this by his wife, Peggy. And when the opportunity arose, Arnold secured from George Washington command of the strategic point on the western bank of the Hudson, West Point, before it was the military academy. One of Peggy's paramours during the British occupation of Philadelphia by the British was Major John Andre, an adjutant of General Henry Clinton, the supreme British commander in North America. And it is with Andre that Arnold colluded to turn over to the British in 1780 the position at West Point. Unfortunately for Arnold, his plans unravel. Andre is captured by three Westchester County, New York militiamen. He is stripped, the papers are found on them, the militiamen realize that they've got something here, and the papers are immediately sent to George Washington, who is on his way precipitously to visit West Point at that point in time. When Washington gets to West Point, he realizes something is amiss. The guards aren't posted. The fortifications are a wreck. He's absolutely mystified as to what's going on. The papers are then presented to him. And when he looks at the papers, his face is crestfallen. And he turns to the Marquis de Lafayette and says, who can we trust now? From that moment on, Arnold becomes a man with a price on his head. Washington orders Andre to be executed at this spot where we are in Japan, New York, and puts a general standing order. Should Arnold be captured on the field of battle, he is to be summarily executed. Arnold will die in 1801 at the age of 60, a spiritually, financially, and emotionally broken man. Battle of Brandywine occurred September 11th, 1777. It was Washington's main attempt to defend Philadelphia from the British invasion. By early afternoon, around two o'clock, American forces in large numbers started coming up Birmingham Road here from the area down near Chad's Fort. It was General Sterling's forces. They were mostly New Jersey troops and some Pennsylvania troops. They were followed by General Adam Stevens' division of Virginians. The Virginians set up about a mile from here on Birmingham Hill and they formed the right flank. 
Sterling set up in the center of the line and General John Sullivan managed to somehow find these two American forces and put himself into some kind of an alignment. The problem was the total number of American troops here maybe was 3,000 and they are faced with 8,000 under Lord Cornwallis. Not only are Cornwallis' forces outnumbering the Americans, it was the flower of the British Army. It was all of the British Grenadiers and Hessian Grenadiers, all the British Light Infantry, plus uh, two British Brigades and Hessian Riflemen. No matter what American troops were put into this fight, they were probably going to lose. And a number of the British and Hessian accounts actually complement how well the Americans fought on this hill, even though they ultimately were driven off. Once um, that part of the attack happened, the American troops retreated right through this area and take up new positions about three quarters of a mile southeast of here. Once that happened, some American artillery started firing at the British at long range. So right in this immediate vicinity, two British 12-pounders, which were the heaviest guns the British had, set up and there was a bit of an artillery duel back and forth across this area. The dead and wounded all lay on the battlefield that night. The British Army set up camp in this vicinity the next day. And Birmingham Meeting House was turned into a hospital. The uh, Dilworth Town Inn, which is just a quarter of a mile from here, that became really the center of the British camp. Also, American prisoners, nearly 400 of them, were brought to uh, Dilworth Town and ultimately uh, marched off with the British Army later. The British camped in this area for the five days after the battle uh, for several reasons. One was um, they, they did take significant casualties, though not as many as later American accounts claim. They probably lost around 500 men killed, wounded, and a few missing. The American army, on the other hand, lost well over a thousand killed, wounded, and at least three to four hundred captured. Hundreds disappeared into the darkness, and whether they went back to the army or not, we don't know. The fact that the British Army sat here the next five days and sent their wounded down to Wilmington, it gave Washington the opportunity to regroup his army and bring them back into Chester County five days later to try to block General Howe's advance on Philadelphia again. The Battle of Brandywine is probably the biggest battle of the war. It is a battle that even though Washington's army lost the army managed to hold together, rally itself, and regroup. In that sense, this battle was great experience for the Continental Army and it showed a bit of resilience. On the side of the British, however, criticism of General Howe after Brandywine was very strong, particularly in England among some Pennsylvania loyalists who said that he was literally letting Washington get away. And uh, he later had to answer to the House of Commons for his delay after this battle. It's the battle that loses Philadelphia in the sense that Washington's army did not defeat the British army here. Ultimately, the British will capture Philadelphia two weeks after this battle.